Michael, um, you you would be considered like an expert on the topic in a sense. You've you've kind of grew up in in Christianity or the church. You left the church, joined the lifestyle, come back out. You speak on the topic regularly. You you know you're well researched on it, which probably isn't the bio of most of us. Like we when we we, we don't share that same background. So maybe like how I mean, if you come and speak on it, that's that's you know your area of specialty in a sense, but. Aside from tapping. Wait, wait, how about this, Adam? How about this? It's not the ministry I would expect, but I know it's mine. Yeah, yeah, amen, amen. But <laughs> yeah, as you tell your story, I'm guessing some of us here can't relate experientially to that. Um, uh -huh. So how do we, in a sense, what are some tips for someone who doesn't have that background? Uh, yeah. Bro um, broaching the topic and sharing the topic in a genuine, authentic way. Thank you, Adam, and I and I think that you make a really excellent point, and I didn't expect that so early, but the Bible says to be harmless as doves, but wise as serpents, and even if it's not your issue, I think that as Christians that care about individuals, that we need to be educated on this topic, not to, not to be instructional, but rather to be foundational about how to minister to people, and just by watching Journey Interrupted, which is free now on the internet, and you can get it in 12 different languages. So we've really kind of covered the bases, but to just spend one hour listening to the story of five individuals that have come from that, I think it's a great place to start to just kind of understand more about how same-sex attraction began for these individuals and also how God was able to interrupt our journeys and about the fact that God does not take away your, your face or your ability to choose, that he respects it and honors it. And I think that that in itself is very uh, educational for church leadership, especially in youth, because the number of children that are struggling with LGBT understanding and acceptance now is exponentially increasing on a daily basis because of the openness to this issue in the world. Okay, appreciate that. Uh, okay, I'm gonna, I've got a couple written down, but I want to throw it open to you guys. Uh, you know, you're the youth leaders on the ground, young people, I'm sure have spoken to you or this issue has come up in forums or, or, or questions. What questions do you have on, on this that you'd like to kind of put to Michael in how, how in your ministry? Okay, uh, NT. Hi. Hands up. Go first. Um, I'd like to know how to start the conversation because we understand that there's the biblical understanding of what relationships are, and then there's the world's understanding, which is being taught to the kids as being normalized to them. So, how do you begin the conversation of saying this is the contrast? and this is the ideal, and this is what's happening in society. How do we start that off? Because I find, I'm finding that very difficult because it's so ubiquitous. This, the kids that I'm, I'm working with feel like some, the Bible's archaic and it, yep. there's, there's something uh, oppressive in the way that it, it's approaching sexuality. So I don't know how to, I haven't found a way to, to start the conversation. No, that's a brilliant question. Um, and, what's that? Is it okay? Right. So um, what I think is really amazing is that that question really takes a lot of effort, I think, on the parents' part as well as the church. And there needs to be an education and an awareness that I think starts very early on. These are conversations that parents should be having with kids even before they were in school not in a way to instruct kids on certain behaviors or differences, but rather if we were foundational talking about God's ideal for identity and sexuality, which, you know, really goes back to creation, talking about that um, God only made two kinds, male and female, and that the union of the mother and the father together that has children, it's a blessing that God gave to men and women in an exclusive relationship to have children. And it's the express image of God. And to establish that and support that and promote that, then you've given the children the truth so that when they're exposed to the, um, to the other side, that they're already foundationally set to know that, wait a minute, that goes against what, you know, what I learned from God and about the Bible. Also, when it comes to identity, 
the simple story of Noah's Ark, you know, uh, God was the one that brought two by two animals into the ark. And I have this program and I talk to young people between the ages of uh, kindergarten through sixth grade. And I basically ask them, I go, you know, did God bring, you know, two boy animals of every kind? No, they say. And I go, was it two girls of every kind? No, the kids say. And, and I go, what was it? And they go, a boy and a girl. And I go, well, why would God need a boy and a girl? And they would say, so they can make babies. What's really amazing is just to go through a simple instructional with the kids and just to just affirm that life begins with a male and a female and that God put a male and a female on the ark, which is another affirmation of the heterosexual relationship between one man and one woman to talk about the fact that we have differences. And yet God's express image of himself is is uh, is exemplified in the relationship between a, a husband and a wife to become a mother and a father when they have children. It's beautiful. And when you give children that anchor, that foundation, then they will know when something goes against that Bible because they've been given the foundation. I don't know. I think it's very simple. Um, and so let me go back a little bit to the beginning part of your question, which I thought was really good. To begin the discussion with someone that might be experiencing LGBT or somebody that might be gay that's in your church, don't start off with the gay issue. You know, it's really none of your business who they sleep with. But the Bible says, if I be lifted up, I will draw all men unto me. And so that's inclusive, whether they're drug addicts or prostitutes or gays or whatever. Put the focus back on a relationship with Jesus Christ, because if you don't have a relationship with Jesus Christ, it doesn't matter what you are. It doesn't matter what you're experiencing. So put the focus back on them knowing Jesus Christ in an intimate relationship. And what's amazing is the Holy Spirit uh, does amazing things to, to show that person that there are other options out there that, um, that God approves of. And, and if they don't have that foundational relationship with Jesus, then none of the other things are gonna matter anyway. Um, somebody said this to me, it was amazing. I was going to breakfast with a friend of mine that I knew was gay. And I would, you know, anytime that I was in the Chattanooga area, I would always call my friend and say, Hey, do you want to go to breakfast or lunch? And we would meet at a restaurant. And I, I was hoping that that was the day that they were going to turn back and come to God. And I went into the restaurant to eat. And as I was obviously promoting, you know, Jesus and coming back, my friend stopped me and he said, listen, Mike, he said, I'm not buying anything, so don't be selling anything. And you know something? That was the best information that I have used even since then. I don't have to sell Jesus. I don't have to sell God. If you live it, if you show it and you share it, then people will be drawn to it. Let God do his job while I do my job. And so don't worry about the gay issue. Don't worry about whether they're drug addicts or whatever focus on how much Jesus loves them. Let them know that they were created and redeemed by a God who loves them and cares for them. Because when they accept that and see that part, then the other stuff come and you don't have to worry about anything else. And that's been my personal experience. People didn't sit there and stick their finger in my face and tell me that I was going to go to hell or I was going to burn in a hotter hell than everybody else because of how I lived. But instead, people were demonstrating to me the love of Jesus Christ in the way that they invited me into their home and shared their meals with me and their love with me. And you know what? Then the Holy Spirit was able to speak to me in profound and meaningful ways that changed my life. Thank you. Appreciate that. Um, mm -hmm. Fari, you're next, then, then Danelle. Um, yeah, just a quick question. So a couple of years ago, I think it was maybe like, I don't remember how long ago, um, we had a member of the youth. I mean, he was he was a new convert. I think he joined the church when he was like 18. Um, he was super on fire for God. And it was like a whole thing, um, baptized everything. And then he, he disappeared for a while. Um, and then we, I think a church elder or something must have run into him in the street and he was now transgender and he'd um, changed everything, his name, everything. Um, he was living with um, his boyfriend, all of that sort of thing. And the reaction of the church was, you know, as can be expected, the way a church would react in that kind of situation. Um, so I guess the question is essentially, how do we as youth leaders kind of deal with obviously our youth going through their situations and also handling the elder people of the church who obviously have a different 
um, reaction um, to somebody coming out as gay or transgender as maybe we would because of the differences in generation and culture. Um, how do you kind of, do you have any advice on how to navigate that kind of thing and to kind of make the situation, I don't know, okay um, for everybody um, involved? Because yeah, it was a very um, complicated kind of situation. Absolutely. The three things that I think that the church really needs most importantly is to be inspired and enlightened and equipped on the issues that are going on in the world today. You know, it's, it's, it's changing at a rapid pace. And if we're going to make a difference in the world, we have to accept the changes that are coming in the world and we have to meet them in the same way that Jesus met people. And I, I use Ministry of Healing, page 143, as a perfect example. It says that Jesus' method alone made lasting results, right? Made uh, true success. And there's like five steps in it. The first step is that Jesus met people where they are. And you know what? We can't expect to use the same words. We can't expect to use the same verbiage that we do among Christians with the world. We have to speak to them on terms that they understand. We have to be compelling. We have to meet them where they are. You know, people don't relate to the word abomination and sin and all that kind of stuff, but they do relate to loving kindness and thoughtfulness and tenderness and compassion, meeting people where they are. That's the first thing that Jesus did. The second thing that he did is he represented himself as somebody who desired their better good. And let me tell you, people are pretty transparent and, and they can see right through our, our facade if we pretend to represent ourselves as somebody who cares when we don't. And so people know when you're sincere and you have to be sincere when you're relating to people of all kinds. The third thing that he did is he ministered to their need. What was their need? Did they need a uh, companionship? Did they need a friendship? What, you know, did they need food? Did they need clothing? Did they need help with something or whatever? And as he ministered to their need, then he won their confidence. One, two, three, four. It took four steps just to win their confidence. Then once he won their confidence, then he bid them to follow him. Let me give you um, a beautiful example. And Adam, you know, these people. When I was uh, coming back into the church, there were three of us. There were three guys that were coming out of the gay life. One was a little skinny uh, Puerto Rican guy. And then there was me, a uh, short and bald hairdresser. And then there was a third guy, this really big black guy with big muscles. And the three of us couldn't look more strange coming into any church culture. But we hung out together because, you know, we understood what each one was going through. And we were there for each other and supportive. So my Puerto Rican friend started studying with this Colombian family. They, they, they were immigrants from Colombia and they spoke Spanish. And so my Puerto Rican friend was studying the Bible with them. And he called me and he said, listen, Mike, you should come to this Bible study. And I said, really? And he goes, yeah, it's on Sunday night. And I go, mm, Bible study on Sunday night. Mm, I don't think so. And he said, well, they feed us. And I said, no problem. I'm there. And so every Sunday night, you know, me and my friend Wayne, the big black guy, and then Ruben, the Puerto Rican guy, there we were, three homosexuals in this little humble family's house. They had no money, you know, they were barely, you know, making ends meet or whatever. They were a very humble couple, and they had a 10-year-old daughter. So here they got a 10-year-old daughter and three homosexuals in their living room, and they were feeding us and studying the word with us, and they were loving us. They didn't just like read the Bible and then kick us out. We play games together. We would talk. If it was somebody's birthday, we, they'd make a cake. These people really showed us that they cared. They met us where we were. They ministered to our need. And then they celebrated with us. So after a few months, the mother asked the husband, she said, hey, do you think they're gay? And the husband said, how would I know? And the mother said, should we be concerned about our daughter? And he said, you know what? Jesus died for them just like he did for us. It shouldn't matter. And she said, I'm so glad you said that because I really love them. You know, that in itself to me was a demonstration of Christ's love and this whole process. And, you know, we, we stayed friends. Three years we studied together in Orlando, Florida, and I moved to Tennessee to get out of the city and they moved with me. They lived with me in my house for several months until they find their house and moved into their house. That little girl that was 10 years old, she grew up. She went to university. Uh, she became a nurse. She met this boy that was interested in her and he wanted to marry her. And because we had been friends for all these years, this boy said, hey, you know, I want to ask you to marry me. And she said, if you want my hand in marriage, you have to ask my father for permission and my Carducci. You know, that is a demonstration of what we have the opportunity to do for anybody in the church. 
you know, we don't look the same, we don't act the same, and we certainly don't come from the same backgrounds. And it doesn't matter. But as we implement Christ's method alone, then we know that true success will come. And you know what, that, that young girl and that boy, they did get married and they have two children and those two children call me uncle to this day. So that's just one example of how we can minister and relate to people and love them. And while we do our part, then let the Holy Spirit do his part. Amen, beautiful, lovely family too. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, Danelle? Hey, uh, hey, uh, thank you so much. I'm literally here just to scribble in. There's so many like, really insightful points. Um, I guess my question is that um, something that I've come across quite a lot actually is the idea that, particularly for transgenderism, um, the Bible doesn't explicitly, well, I haven't come across as well myself. The Bible, although it gives guidance on sexual um, sexuality and principles um, on sexuality, um, it doesn't explicitly outline, you know, principles and like transgenderism particularly and so I've come across a, quite a few questions on you know well, the bible doesn't explicitly you know say give guidance on this so I guess how do you how would you recommend navigating those questions or kind of incorporating biblical principles um to help give guidance on that as well yeah. sure um you know the bible well I'll give you an example and, and then I, I want to give you a testimony so the Bible in Deuteronomy chapter 22, it says that a man shall not wear the clothing of a woman, nor shall a woman wear the clothing of a man. It is an abomination. Let's be very clear on that. It's not calling the transgender person an abomination. It, cause, it calls the behavior an abomination because what it does is it confuses the, uh, the, the differences between male and female and the ability to identify that way. So with the transgender issue, of course, it's very confusing and it is going to, there's no way that we're going to do away with it. And, and it's on the rise everywhere around the world. But um, in dealing with that issue, um, let me give you an example. There was a man that was molested by his mother and she sexually molested him. And while she was molesting him sexually, she told him how awful men were and how awful having a penis was. And this boy was like 13 years old when his mother was molesting him. So he grew up with this feeling like, I can't be a man. Men are horrible. Men are awful. And so by the time he was in his late 30s, he ended up having a sex change. There was a lot of confusion. There was molestation involved. And so he was living as a female, thinking that that would help. He completely mutilated his genitals. He had breast implants done. He was on the hormone treatment you know, for all these years. And yet he was living this way, thinking that this was the best way to express himself. He went to a Bible study meeting and in that Bible study meeting, there was um, a woman and she was working at the door and she was a friend of mine. Her name was Joyce. And so Joyce welcomed this person. You know, she was uh, a widow. Her husband had died. So she would invite this person to come and spend the afternoon together. They would make food together. They would study the word of God. She never even said anything about the fact that he was obviously not a real woman but she loved him and she demonstrated to him Christian courtesy and love and compassion and hospitality. She was praying for him, praying that asking God that would, you know, God would help this person and, and bring him to an understanding about who God really was. They went to an afternoon meeting. And in that afternoon meeting, there was one scripture verse that really caused a change in this man's heart living as a woman. And it was staying away from the appearance of evil. And that was like a lightning bolt experience for Danielle, who, who used to be Daniel. And at that moment, Danielle realized that she was not living according to the way that God made her. She had the breast implants taken out. She, took, she stopped taking the hormone treatments. She started dressing as a man that she was born with. And Daniel even got married two years ago and found a doctor that could restore his male genitalia. I don't even know what that, you know, even seems like or whatever, but it's amazing the transformation that God made on his heart and nobody counseled him. Nobody got in his face and, and told him how to live and that this was wrong. Instead, as people loved him, the Holy Spirit spoke to Daniel and through the support and loving kindness of a church, he was able to find his way. And now he's married and living as a male again and completely restored. That's pretty, that's pretty cool. That's pretty amazing, isn't it? Very amazing. So, yeah. So 
So with the transgender issue, again, you know, uh, it's going to be really confusing about what bathrooms do they use and, you know, how do we uh, share the gospel with them? You know, do we bring them into our homes and, and share a meal with them? And, and I think that, you know what, if they're a human being and if God loves them, then we should show them how much God loves them. And that doesn't mean that we avoid the topic, but if they bring it up, that's an open door allowing us to walk through it and in a very compassionate and compelling way to talk about how God has a design for each one of us. Not in a condemnatory way. Don't put your Bible at the end of the table and whack them over the head during the dessert. Instead, what you want to do is you want to draw their hearts. Oh, oh I love this. I love it. Here's my bumper sticker. Jesus doesn't drive. He draws. Jesus doesn't push an agenda. Instead, what he does is he draws us to him. And I believe that we as Christians should be doing the same. So I, again, if we're educating our youth and letting them know what God's intention is for identity and sexuality, then, then if our children still choose to go astray, that doesn't mean that they're lost. What we need to do is to hunker down and to really start pleading with the Holy Spirit to impress upon their hearts. And, and let me be very clear on that because maybe I should have started with this point. The Holy Spirit is the one that convicts us of sin and our behaviors. And that's not my job to do. And so most people tend to turn to prayer as a last result when really it should be our first line of defense. If you believe that there's power in prayer, if you believe that the Holy Spirit does his job, then quit trying to meddle and get in the way and start praying for that individual, praying earnestly that God would give you opportunities. And if he can't use you, then ask him to use someone else or something else. And amazing and miraculous things start to happen. So again, if we're praying and fasting for these individuals, we shouldn't even open our mouths until we've at least uh, uh, prayed about it and asked God for the guidance and made sure that everything that comes out of our mouth is loving and compassionate and, and drawing rather than driving people. And, and that's a really difficult thing to do. You know something, it would be so much easier to just condemn them and kick them out of the church. Mm -hmm. Done, you know, that problem settled. Or it would be easier to just like say, oh, God doesn't mind, bring your boyfriend or, or change your, your gender, just come on into church, la la la. But you know what, it's much harder, much more difficult to be compassionate and loving somebody and to not say anything until the Holy Spirit gives you that opportunity and the utterance and instead to demonstrate the love of God. It'd be much easier to be one way or the other way. And so you're going to need the power of the Holy Spirit. And many times I say to parents and to loved ones, please do not even open your mouth unless the Holy Spirit gives you the words to speak and that you question, make sure that every word that comes out of your mouth is compassionate and truthful, compassionate first. Thank you. Mala? Yes. Uh, thank you, Michael, for everything that you've been saying, because I've also been saying it too with one of my elders when we're talking about this topic. Oh, hallelujah. This year in my church, I really want to tackle this topic because uh -huh. about sometime last year, one of my youths we were having a conversation and they were talking about how they express their sexuality to a friend. And I heard the word that I'm bisexual and my, like literally my head just went bing. And I didn't say anything at the time because I says, you know what? Don't say anything, just remember, remember, take note. So that mm. happened about last year. And throughout that time, I've been communicating with them, trying to get them into church and get them active. But I haven't said anything about that issue yet. I've just been buying time mainly. And then since last year, at the end of the year, another youth came out saying that they are bisexual. And I says, OK, OK, this is a serious topic now. And what I've also found is that some of the some of the youths feel that God does not love them. Mm, mm. That does God hate them because of their preferences. That and it's caused one of them to be in hospital, to have problems with their family, and they're still struggling with that with that um, question. And I said to them, wait, because. I don't have the answers right now. 
but can you be patient with me for now and we will discuss this topic so have you got any further advice if anyone's going through this at this moment where a youth yeah. comes out to them right right and and let's be clear in, in the last several years did you know that the transgender issue has increased 1000 percent among children just in the uk alone and, and you know what so a thousand percent increase you know that's that's 10 times 100% increase. And so there's, there's doctors and there's psychologists that are urging these children to take hormones and to have these surgeries so that they can become the sex that, that they desire. So, and, and there's also a promotion that Christianity is cruel and that they're full of haters and judges. So some of what children are getting or people are getting, you know, they're not getting from our example. However, the Christian community has been extremely cruel and unloving and so we've earned that reputation, but we have to turn that reputation around. Um, your, your response was beautiful. And rather than say the wrong thing, by, by asking for time and asking the Holy Spirit to guide your conversations and the opportunities um, to present that topic, I think are amazing. Thank you. That instead of you know standing on your own and your own information that you chose to ask the Holy Spirit to move you. I have an example that I think is really brilliant. There was a girl. And she was studying with a gay couple for two years in her, in, her, in her living room. And Adam, I think you know this girl, her name's Lisa. So Lisa was a Bible worker. She loved these guys. She said, listen, they're like family to me. And they asked after two years, they said, you know, we're ready to be baptized and we're ready to, um, we're ready to give our hearts to Jesus. And, you know, we, we love the Sabbath and everything. And they said, what does the Bible say about homosexuality? And Lisa's mouth fell open. And here for two years, she hasn't touched the topic or brought up the topic, but she's been having these guys in her living room for two years. Mm -hmm. And when she asked me that, she said that to the guy, she said, listen, give me some time to really study it. And I said to her, I said, why do you need to study it and present it to them? If the Holy Spirit's been working for the last two years and they're ready to make a commitment, I said, why don't you study it with them together and let the Holy Spirit lead them? I thought that was brilliant. So the next week they prayed together. They asked the Holy Spirit to lead them. And then one by one, she brought up those verses and she shared that with them. And both of these men were under conviction at the time. It was beautiful. It was beautiful. And so your response to them, I think, is, is perfect. Asking the Holy Spirit to lead and looking for opportunities where the Holy Spirit can really work in advance. Now, if somebody doesn't ask, I don't necessarily feel like it's my place to, to present that. But if somebody really wants to know the truth and they're asking with the Holy Spirit's help and with kindness and compassion overload to share with them the truth and how God is crazy about them and loves them and what the truth is. What do you think of that? Thank you. That's brilliant. That's really good. Thank you. Hey, Michael, um, you, you mentioned pornography and the statistics you gave were pretty, pretty shocking. I think 3% of boys or men haven't seen it and 11% of women and I think 50% of people, I can't remember exactly the statistics you gave, but any tips you could share on A, how to broach the topic, B, what resources to share with people, uh, how to, you know, for overcoming it, yeah. et cetera. And, and you know something, we need to start with our leadership and 62% of pastors are addicted to pornography and it's 17% of girls and 3% of boys, not even, not even teenagers or adults. We're talking about children have never seen pornography. So in situations like that, the parents should be the first lines of defense and anyone that allows their child to have unlimited access to the internet is like giving a razor blade to an infant. Now, whoever's listening to this you know, knows the power of internet pornography and the accessibility. And you yourselves know that if you have unlimited access to the internet, that you are slimed on a regular basis with online porn. I have internet protection on all of my devices, my phone, my iPad, my, my computer, because I come from sexual addiction and I need better protection to protect me. And here I am a man in my sixties, so imagine the vulnerability of a child when a parent just hands them the phone and just lets them have access to all this stuff. 
you know, unfortunately now, did you know that 90% of children between the ages of six and eight have been exposed to online pornography and mostly while doing homework? So we got to get our heads out of the dirt. And as parents and as leaders in our churches, we have to provide accountability and protection for our children and then deal with the issue. We have to keep the lines of communication open with our children. We can't be so condemning that our children fear to come with us and say, mommy, I saw something ugly on the internet. Because if they see pornography and if they feel guilty that they can't come to their parents and confess this, then they start to keep a secret with the enemy. And the next thing you know is your children end up addicted to this thing, even in your own household and with no hope and with no one that they can confide in or find protection from. So again, in my opinion, it starts with the parents, then it goes to the teachers, and then ultimately the church. And the parents have a grave responsibility to protect their children from the things that are on the internet that slime them. Unfortunately, in, in Christianity, too many parents either don't have the time or don't think that it's an issue, and therefore their children have been slimed right in their own homes. Thank you. Any other questions, guys, you've got? Um, fire away. You don't get this opportunity to be with uh, driving with Michael Carducci very often. <laughs> <laughs> On the road. Actually, we're in the driver. So, right. Yeah, yeah, my friends. Look, look, there's Sonia. <laughs> and there's her husband. That's Jonas. <laughs> and they're sitting here trapped. They're trapped <laughs> listening to your whole program. Hey, well, appreciate their patience and, uh, oh, and support. Oh, that's sweet. That's sweet. They're wonderful people. They're wonderful people. Uh, we got another question from NT. Then I've got a couple more as well. Maybe one of your questions is what we had for dinner. <laughs> 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 Listen, Adam, I know it's one of yours. What, Adam, did, you have, what did you have for dinner then? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. All right. You tell them. You tell them. Son, you tell them what you had. What we had. A red Thai curry. Mm. Uh, <laughs> oh, and dessert. And dessert. What do we have for dessert, Jonas? Um, chocolate, chocolate cream, and uh, mango, fresh mango. Wow! So now that you know good. why I'm in the back seat of a car and not in a house because <laughs> I was eating. <laughs> All right, so that's our little intermission. Now back to the questions. I'm sorry. Okay, uh, there was a hand. Uh, where, where have you gone? Uh, yeah. Um, I, I wanted to ask, uh, sort of in line with what you were saying with the parents, because I found um, a lot of the, the parents um, in my church are coming from more conservative backgrounds and sort of more awesome. sort of awesome. os ostrich type backgrounds where they kind of just bury their hand and head in the sand and hope the kids will figure it out at some point. So they have been throwing a lot of stuff at us in the youth and teens ministry and being like, you guys deal with it. And we're like, we can only do so much. You guys have to do the heavy lifting. So we've been trying to work with them, but their attitude is just like, well, it's your, it's your deal. That's what you signed up for. So how exactly can we work with parents with that attitude? Because right, we right, right. have such so little influence. Yeah. So give them a reality check and say, you know what? I'm not the one that has to stand in front of God and say, what did you do with the children I gave you? You know, it's the parents response. They're the ones that are going to be standing in front of God. And when God says, what did you do with the children that I gave you? It's not going to be the teachers and the pastors that are going to be standing there accountable. It's them. They're the first line of defense. However, if you recognize that you do have, you're the second layer of protection for the children then start talking about it, start talking openly, start collecting information. You know, there's so much um, information out there coming out ministries. We have videos, we have resources, we have books. As a matter of fact, um, Ron Woolsey, my colleague came out with a book called um, Navigating the Storms of Contemporary Sexuality, Identity and Love. Hello, that's something every parent, every teacher, every pastor needs in their churches to help navigate this very difficult issue. There's one resource, and you can get that at comingoutministries.org. And then if you go to knowhislove.org, you can also get another uh, resource. Oh, look, I just happen to have one here beside me. Ta-da! 
and it's called <laughs> Line by Line, and it's by Wayne Blakely, and you can get that at noahslove.org. And this also is an, a brilliant response to a, a, uh, a resource that's being promoted, and I'm sure that it's coming to England if it isn't already there. Uh, have you heard of Guiding Families of LGBT? Raise your hand. Anyone? Anyone heard of it? So anyway, Guiding Families is a resource, basically gagging families rather than guiding families. Because in this book, it says that we need to love our LGBTQ uh, individuals. And that's true. We need to love them. And we need to love them unconditionally, which the book promotes. However, it deceptively says, do not pray with your children. Do not you know, uh, give them your theology. It basically says to love them and accept them as LGBT. And you know what, that, it, that destroys the power of what Jesus Christ did on the cross for each one of them. And so this booklet, line by line that Wayne produced, it goes line by line through guiding families. It talks about the deception that's built into that. But in the same, in the same booklet, he has 19 testimonies of people that have come out of LGBTQ lives. And you know something, Revelation 12, 11, says that we overcome not only by the blood of the lamb, but by the word of our testimony. And you know what, when you actually hear testimonies of people in multiple denominations that are walking according to the word of God and, and having new lives, let me tell you something that says a lot about addressing the very difficult topic of LGBTQ uh, promotion, not only in the world, but now what's coming into our churches. So, so resources, guys, you know, get a hold of these things, read them, and I think that it'll help to to really guide some really difficult uh, conversations. Thank you, Michael. A follow up to the question that I asked on addictions and stuff, and that was, you did mention a few things like you got blockers on your phone, but any uh -huh. other um, things that you you recommend to tackle the the issue of sexual addiction absolutely thank you adam and and i apologize that i missed that i use covenanteyes.com covenanteyes.com and if you use the promo code c o m safe c o m s a f e coming out ministries will actually uh, give you a discount uh, and I think you get a free month uh, with that. So that really helps to to offset the cost of it. But coming out minister, I'm sorry, Covenant Eyes is a great uh, internet security because if it blocks anything that may be questionable and sometimes it's actually blocked my own ministry. But at least I'm grateful for that because it, it keeps from the spiraling into uh, what pornography uh, does on the internet. So it's a great resource. There's another one called um, Accountability for You accountabilityforyou.com. And uh, that's also another accountability group that you can have for your internet. So there's two resources to help keep your computers safe, not only for yourselves, but also for your families. Thank you. Um, can can I have like a two minute break just to get in the house? Yeah, go ahead, go ahead. Yeah, walk in the house. Okay, yeah, all right, hang on guys, hang on. Don't go anywhere. <laughs> oh, here, I'll stop speaking German. <laughs> Hey guys, I hope you find. Oh, yeah, I see your hand up. Sorry. Um, there any other hands? We've probably got about 10, 15 minutes left. So if you do have a question that you want to to be asked, then please take advantage of the time now. And uh... oh wow, they were like not their house. They're dropping them off. Adam, what was that fifty percent discount code again? Yeah, I I I forgot. It. I need to ask him again. <laughs> All right. Um, I caught it. It was C O M safe. Okay. I can put it. Uh, in the yeah, thank you. 
Yes, C O M safe. I didn't. Re I thought you were yeah. like their house. I didn't realize they were dropping you off and literally waiting for you to finish. That's really nice of them. <laughs> right, right, right. It's good. Good. All right, I'm safely. In Thank you. Okay, we've got three more questions. Uh, I think Farry was next, then NT, then oh. Sam. Um, yeah, so in terms of a, not really addressing, but if you've, um, say you've got a youth um, who's either struggling with addiction or um, sexual identity or whatever it is, um, and their family is aware of the situation and their response to it is to kind of just, you know, let them be them and then just, you know, leave it as it is and show them love and everything, et cetera, but kind of not do anything about it because obviously that's who they are as a person. Do we need to step in? Like, I guess it's kind of like, where is our boundary and is it kind of our responsibility to intervene if the family is comfortable with everything as it is? Like, do we need to do we need to get involved or do we just kind of pray from a distance and let the Lord work it's on the okay if I come to the table? Okay. <laughs> Can you repeat the question again, please? Um, yeah. So if um, there's a member of the youth who's either um, struggling with addiction or sexual identity or whatever it is, um, and their family's aware of the situation and the family's response is they're just going to leave them as they are and they accept and love them um, with who they are and they don't feel like they need to change, um, do we, as I guess youth leaders or just members of the church as friends, do we like, is it our place to get involved? Um, if the family's okay with what they are. So like, do I need to step in or am I just okay praying from a distance and just leaving it as it is? Okay. So, so let's look at that for a second. You know, when is it our position to step in against the will of the parents and to start, you know, talking to their children? Be, because that to me is a, is a boundary that we don't have the right to, um, to overstep. If the child is interested, if the child wants to know the truth, if the child is pursuing it, that's one thing. But if the parents have already accepted their children being LGBT and the children have accepted that and moved on, uh, you know, that to me is, is, is almost an act of aggression to sit there and proselytize the child and to tell them what your thoughts and your views are. Um, I, again, let's stop and think about this. It's not my job to convert them. It's God's job. And you know what? If God can use somebody or anybody else, he doesn't always need me. I'm not the only one that can make a difference in somebody's life. So as a youth leader, I think that the best thing that you can do is to love them and to create relationships with them. And and they probably already know the stand of the church. And so love them, demonstrate to them that you still accept them for who they are, even though you don't, you know that that's not truthful for them, but that God has something else and then get busy praying for them. And, and the prayer that I would pray is Lord, interrupt their journey, interrupt their plans. Don't give them what they seek and show them their need of you. The problem isn't that they're gay. The problem isn't that they're transgender or bisexual. The problem is that they don't know Jesus. And you know what? It's not heterosexual people that go to heaven. It's redeemed people that go to heaven. So the problem isn't their sexuality. The problem is that they don't have a relationship with Jesus Christ. That's, the, that's what I would focus on, on them knowing. So again, that prayer, Lord, interrupt their plans. Don't give them what they seek and show them their need of Christ. I can't think of anything more sincere in addressing the issue without, you know, overstepping our boundaries and, and being so confrontational in an aggressive way that only pushes them further away. I can't hear you. Are you on mute? Oh, yeah. No, sorry. I was talking to myself. But yeah, no, that makes sense. <laughs> okay. Okay. But do you see how that can be like really over aggressive and just push somebody further away? Especially yeah, no, I feel it because it was something that came up um, at a different church of mine where the church kind of felt it was their place to get involved, uh -huh. um, which I personally didn't really feel comfortable with. But then I didn't know if by me not being involved, I was kind of not witnessing for God in the way I was supposed to. So it was just kind of that kind of figuring out what the balance is. Okay, well, you know something, you make me think about something that 
I didn't take into consideration. What if we're talking about a child that's already been baptized in the church and is an active member in the church? And if yeah, they're actively the living in a gay life? And they were I'm baptized and I think they were music leader. I mean, she's uh, she was like 20, 21, 19, 20, uh, but she was the leader of the music in the church. So that's why the church kind of felt they didn't need to get involved, but it was kind of very, I don't really know if that's the place. Because sure. the family's all aware and they're okay with it. They know her girlfriend and everything. Um, but the church was still very all right well then then my response is different because when you are a baptized member in the church it's different if you're not baptized you know you have the freedom to come to church you have the freedom to you know pursue whatever you want but when you're a member of the church you made a covenant you made an agreement when you were baptized that you were going to live according to the principles of the bible and that you were pursuing a relationship with christ and that you know, the goal was heaven. So in a situation like that, somebody that is a church member that has a, um, that has been baptized, you know, they have rights, they have a vote, they have a voice in the church. And so for somebody that's not living according to the principles of the church that they've been baptized into, that's different. Then the church has an obligation to compassionately come to them and and implore them and just say listen you know we want to make sure that that you want heaven and that this is your direction and remember you made this decision and that's why you got baptized and so this is not in agreement with the word of god nor god's plan for you and so if that person says nope i'm gay this is just who i am or whatever then you say you know what you have the right to make that decision however because you are a baptized member of the adventist church we're going to have to ask that you um, that you ask to have your your name taken off the books, or we're going to have to take your name off the books because this basically means that you've changed your direction and that this is no longer your goal or your direction. But in a situation where somebody is a baptized member of a church, that's different because you do have the right to step in. Just like if a if a if one of your elders was sleeping with a woman or living with a woman and he wasn't married to her. Yeah, you have the right to step in and just say, hey, listen, you know, this is a situation and it's not that they're, you know, it's not just because they're gay that you're addressing it. It's because, you know, they're sexually stepping outside of the boundaries of what the Adventist church supports and what the Bible supports. So that is an issue that the church has to deal with. So uh, I'm sorry about that. In a situation where they're not a baptized member, you know, that's when you still need to pray, but it's, what is it? Matthew 18, I believe, where it talks about restoring a brother, but if they will not be restored, then, then we have to cut them free and, and allow that to be their decision. But I wish that the church would really exercise some compassion in a situation like that. And, you know, a lot of times we're so quick to just cut a member loose and then just, you know, uh, never think about it again and, you know, never minister to them again and basically cut them off. But they still, as long as there's breath inside that individual, they still have the opportunity to be redeemed. And so when they choose to lose their membership and walk away into their to their life choices, we should still be praying. We should still be asking God to intervene in their lives and to work for their salvation. You know, but I, I see so many churches like, oh, good riddance, they're gone. And then that's it. And never spoken of again. Thank you, Michael. Good answer. Mm -hmm. um, Enoch, hey, I go, I see you. <laughs> uh, Sam. I think someone else was before me. Was it uh, before me? Oh, oh yeah, there was a hand. You put it, took it down, yeah. or maybe you asked it. Okay, okay. Um, so yeah, first of all, thank you, Michael, for, for joining us and thank you so much for your answers and just for being willing to share. Um, I was just wondering for the youth leaders here, if you were if you were a youth leader and you just joined, what would be your top three priorities in the domain of sex, sexuality, and relationships that you were like, okay, top three, I want to make sure that I address with these with the youth over my year or two years that I'm going to be a youth leader. Yeah. Top three things that I would talk about is probably maybe the top three presentations that I give. And um, one is I want out talking about how to break free from uh, pornography and sexual addiction. 
and also masturbation. And I would also talk about why wait, which is why should I wait uh, before marriage to have sex? What's the benefit of it? And I think that we do a disservice to our young people when we say, don't have sex, don't have sex, but we don't reason with them. And we don't tell them and affirm to them that sex is God's design. It was, it was a gift that God gave to, to, to man, but to be used in a specific way. And that presentation basically talks about the benefit of why we should wait before marriage to have sex. And, you know, talks about the difference of diseases and psychologically what sex does to individuals. Um, and I think it's a powerful lesson to let people know that while God will respect your choice, there are benefits for those who choose to wait before um, merit, wait, before having sex, wait, bef let me say this right. We've got, we've got, we're waiting got. for after marriage to have sex. Yeah. And then the third thing that I would talk about is, um, again, educating our children without instructing them, you know, educating our children about sexuality, what's out there in the world, because here, here I think is the, the big dilemma. And I think that, uh, especially for any family that has small children, how do you educate your children to be prepared to live in a world that is completely saturated with sexuality and yet still guard their innocence. And Adam and Iko, I'm sure that that's one of your biggest concerns, especially for Enoch at such a young age, like how is it that you protect them by giving them enough information to know what to stay away from, and yet at the same time to protect their innocence so that they're not exposed to sexual things too soon, but at the same time to alert them to what the danger signs are to run from uh, in, in their development and every year, that information changes based on the amount of what they're able to process mentally. So parents, especially living in this world, I think as a youth leader, I would definitely be very concerned about making sure that, that every age group has appropriate information to deal with um, the, the issues that are coming in the world so that by the time they are at an age where they're out in the world, that they at least know what's going on in the world. And when we shelter our children and refuse to talk about anything, you have not fitted them for what they're about to face out in the world. And if you have not taught them how to discipline the internet, how to protect themselves from uh, the pornography and stuff that's out there, you know, the minute that they get out on their own, they will be complete victims and unable to fight the, the, the huge flood of sexuality that's in the world. How about gaming? The same thing with gaming. That's, that's a huge issue. I, I have family members that were addicted to gaming when they were 16 and 17 years old, and now they're 30, unable to date because they're totally consumed with online gaming. They don't even go to church anymore you know, because they're so addicted to this gaming and they don't even have social lives outside of what they're interacting with online all because these addictions started for them at 16 years old when they were given a, you know, a computer or, or, you know, these Game Boys. Thank you for that much. Thank you for that. It's very much appreciated. Thank you, sir. There's another question in the chat box, Michael. How do you, uh, how do you take a compassionate approach, especially in aftercare? I'm not sure, Danelle, what do you want to define as aftercare? Unless you get, get it, Michael. <laughs> Yeah, what is aftercare? I'm going to suggest um, essentially just looking after what you answered it um, as okay. I put the question through. So it's more like after, you know, if it does get to a point where people need to be removed from a position or service or anything, oh, how right. do we look, at them, look after them beyond the oh, service? Oh, good. Surprise, okay. You know? Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, let, let's just use an example. Um, you know, let's say for, for instance, well, I have a really good friend. I have a very dear friend. And um, she was married to her husband and they ended up uh, getting divorced and she left the church and everybody else quit talking to her. Everybody else was talking behind her back. And you know something? We stayed friends. She would continue to come and visit with me. She was dating a guy that she wasn't married to. And she came up to visit me. And, and I said, you know, if, you, if you're going to stay here, you have to sleep in separate bedrooms. No problem, she said, you know, and we carried on our friendship. Uh, on Sabbath, we still had our devotions. And I, I didn't insult her intelligence. She knew how I lived. And when she came to my house, she knew what was expected. And she was okay with that. But, you know, when she needed me, I was there for her. You know, when she started covering herself in, in jewelry and tattoos and riding motorcycles or whatever, I still loved her. I still loved her because she was my friend. 
but I didn't compromise the principles, but I still stayed in touch with her. I call her on her birthday. You know, I comment on her stuff on Facebook. It's difficult. It's so difficult because you just want to shake them and remind them that we are living in a time when you don't have much time to, to play around with, you know, jeopardizing your salvation. But you know what? I know that this is God's job. And if I do my part to stay connected to her and to be a grounding for her, and when she needs me, she calls me. When she's really depressed and upset, she calls me and I pray for her. And she knows that that's who I am. I haven't changed who I am. And even though she's changed, by staying stable and continuing to reach out and to loving these individuals, I still believe that you keep the lines of communication open for them to return. So I'm sorry, let me use another example of another friend of mine that, that also, uh, he was the voice of reason for me for a few years. And, and as much as I was trying to self-deceive myself into thinking that I could have a boyfriend or stay in my gay culture, he gave me so much information that was straight from the Holy Spirit. Unfortunately, I continued my journey with Jesus Christ. And after about five years, he went back into the gay life. He's now married to a man that he's been married to for 10 years. And you know something? He, he really put a lot of distance between our friendship where we weren't even communicating and just about four years ago, we started talking again, and he responds to some of my Facebook posts. I've met with him. I've gone to dinner with him. You, when we shut down people, when we shut them out, I think that we, that we misrepresent the love of Christ even more. We should stay the course. We should stay the same. We don't compromise our principles, but our love should be exceeding what they can get out in the world, and they should, they should know by our example that if we don't give up on them, that God doesn't give up on them either. Give them something to return to. That's my thought for aftercare. Thank you, thank you. Um, there was a question in the box about, are there any resources for different age groups? Um, but you know. All right, so here's the good news, here's the good news. No, there's not, but, but that's not the good news. Here's the good news. Um, I, I have a program that I do for children between the ages of kindergarten and sixth grade. And again, affirming uh, biblical just to, identity. Just to clarify the ages, kindergarten is what age and sixth grade is what age? Okay, so we're talking about like preschool, four years old, three years old, four years old, all the way up to like 12 years old. And okay. it, yeah. And it basically is foundational about God's I ideal for identity and sexuality. And it basically um, goes through the steps and confirms God's ideal without even talking about the LGBT agenda or issue. We talk about the rainbow. We talk about Noah's Ark. We talk about creation. Three beautiful things that God has put in his word to affirm healthy identity and sexuality so that when they're exposed to the error or to the other alternatives, they already know foundationally. And by creating relationships with our children, it also gives them something or someone that they can come to and say, wait, wait, I heard this. Is this true? And then we're actually creating a resource out of that um, presentation uh, through one of the seminary colleges. I'm actually working with the director of education and get this, get this, this is shocking, but I'm also working with a woman that has a master's in gender studies. Can you believe it? And so we're going to put together this resource for kids. And I think it'll be an amazing resource, not only for churches, but also for schools, as well as for parents, uh, most importantly. So it'll have a workbook that'll, you know, be for the parent and this teacher as well as another book for the uh, student or the child. And I think that that's a really great way to uh, keep the lines of communication open and to help direct our children. What do you think? What do you think? Good stuff. Uh, Marla and Sam, are these, yeah. Yeah, Marla, Sam? Um, Last two questions. My question is like, I know some of the youths, they have friendship and the friendships are quite toxic in a sense that they just, they keep on arguing, they keep on fighting, but they keep going back to that friend, that either one particular friend or, or a group of them. And how I would class that as, as addicted to a type of a 
views in a sense. So how would you be able to give advice to a youth in letting go of toxic relationships? Um, it's, a, it's a really tough subject because if you're too critical, you'll push them right into their arms. And I think what you have to do is, again, we have to draw them, you know, and tell them, you know, that by beholding me become changed, you know, what are the friends that you have? What are you listening to? Because you know what? Some of us are like Dinah's. Do you know what I'm saying about that? You know, some of us are intrigued by the people that are on the outside. And I have many Adventists that say, wow, what would it be like to wear jewelry? What would it be like to have a tattoo? What would it be like to, you know, experience sexuality? And, and so, some of that intrigue is normal and natural, especially for adolescents. But if adolescents have had a good grounding and if they have parents that they can trust, that they feel that they can go to, that are a good foundation for them, you know, by the time you're a teenager, you're kind of breaking away from your parents and you're wanting your own identity and your own ability. And by then, you know, whatever work has been done in the early years, it's done. It's over because kids in their teens are no more interested in their parents' ideals. They want to form their own and they want to be accepted in that culture. So if they have friends that they keep going back to for that information, in my opinion, and I don't know, I don't have any validation on uh, child development, but you can already tell that these kids either didn't get the foundation that they needed to be grounded, or they're being drawn away from it by their own curiosity or, or interest in what's going on in the world. Oh, it's so sad when a young person says to me, you know what, Mike, if I had as much sex as you, you know, and if I experienced the things that are out there in this world, you know, then, then I would be ready to give God my heart and, and to be a devoted Christian, you know, but I grew up in the church and I was really sheltered. And so I didn't have the opportunity to experience those things. And so maybe I just need to get it out of my system. That is the most frightening thing to hear from any individual. And I hear it often, you know, people that think that they had a conservative upbringing in the Adventist church, that that's a liability or that they were denied something. And, and you know something, sometimes the leadership in the church or even the youth leaders miss an opportunity to celebrate the good things of purity, to celebrate, you know, it's like, don't do this and don't do that and don't do this and don't do that. You know, when you stick your finger in someone's face and tell them what they can't do, and then you make everything like a drudgery of what you can't do and a list of do's and don'ts. And then they see out in the world that there are people that are having so much fun and doing all these wonderful things, then we miss the opportunity to celebrate the goodness of what God is. And so focus on the good things that you can develop for your youth. You know, parents that waste the Sabbath away by sleeping the day and not taking their kids on a special hike or to the lake or to a special place and celebrating the Sabbath. We are teaching our children to go into the world to find their joy because there's no joy in a Christian life that is just filled with don'ts. And we set that up more, I believe, than what the world does by not celebrating the good things about being a Christian. Yeah, yeah I'm just- Wait, isn't there a quote? Isn't there a quote from Ellen White? Do not give your children, do not plant inside your children's mind the thought that if you were in heaven, that it would be a terrible place to be. Did you hear that? And, and that's a paraphrase, but that's in that's that's pretty generally what the quote says. It's like, don't ever give your children the thought or the impression that if you were in heaven, that it would be a miserable place to be. And you know what? We have the opportunity as youth leaders to celebrate and to show our youth that it's good to be an Adventist and the wonderful things that, um, that come our way by being an Adventist from early on up. Thank you very much. Um, just really just to say thank you. And, all, and also, if somebody wanted to support, what, what are some of the best ways that we can support coming out ministries? I, I am, I'm having a hard time hearing you, sir. Yeah, yeah. Just, just to say thank you so much for your, your responses. And also, if somebody wanted to support coming out ministries, what would be the best way to, to go about that process. Ah, thank you. You know what, we have an incredible newsletter that we put out every month. We talk about the current situations. We talk about 
testimonies. We have a testimony every month. We also have a question and answer thing that we post on our newsletter. Please go to comingoutministries.org, sign up for our newsletter, and then we also have a donate button. And if you want to set up a monthly donation, um, we, we have been working full time now for the last five, six years. And, and we have staff members that are working behind the scenes. We have a prayer group that, that pray over our prayer requests that you can leave on the website. We have uh, three prayer lines that are public. We also have two uh, prayer lines for people that are coming out of LGBT groups. Um, so we're active, we are moving and we're doing resources and we are only funded by donations. So if you are touched by this ministry, if you believe that this is uh, an end time ministry that is present truth and you wanna you know, uh, get around us and help support us, if you set up a monthly donation, we'll send you a, a receipt at the end of the year, and you will know that your money is being well spent on helping to promote this, the, uh, the education of what healthy sexuality is, as well as providing opportunities for churches to be enlightened and also educated and equipped about this issue so we can prepare safe places in our churches for, um, for young and old. So thank you. Great question. Thank you. So, so the donate thing is just on the website. Uh huh. Correct. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Uh huh. Uh, another question, Michael. I appreciate that. Um, all your answers so far, and, and for taking the time out of your your busy culinary schedule tonight. <laughs> <laughs> wait a minute. Wait a minute. I can say this now. I can say this now. Listen, the couple that I was with, they're Buddhist, and they came oh, wow. to my presentation yesterday. They're a Buddhist couple. They are not Christian at all. And you know something, they were in the car listening to our whole presentation. Trust me, you guys, I, I felt that this was an opportunity for ministry. And I've never met them before until yesterday. And they took me for the day and they they showed me around and we sat and talked. And I even saw their, you know, the place where they do their Buddhist yoga and worship or whatever in their home. And I just shared with them what Jesus has done for me in my life. And you know what? they're wonderful people they're so so kind and wonderful and here they were willing to just sit in the car and not interrupt this this transmission and we were just talking openly and um i i i'm praying for them and i'm hoping that that this is the gospel in action for them as well so anyway if you met sonia and and um her husband uh, jonas please pray for them and pray that the lord will touch their hearts the wonderful people Thank isn't that you. cool yeah. that's pretty cool yeah. that's pretty cool uh, the other question is, if someone, um, I, I'm not put, just just asking, if someone wanted you to speak like on Zoom or something for their local mm -hmm. church or something like that, how would they go about contacting you? Is it just through the website or how? Sure. There's a couple of ways. You can go through the website at comingoutministries.org. You can also email me at michael at comingoutministries.org. And so again, comingoutministries.org, and you can initiate an email there. And we have uh, at least five, I think we have six speakers now. We have men and women. We have two senior speakers, which is Ron Woolsey and myself, who started the ministry 10 years ago. We also have um, uh, women and other men that can also speak about sexual purity, about coming out of LGBT understanding. And we have lots of videotapes as well. So you can email me directly at Michael at comingoutministries.org, or you can just email the, the ministry website and give us a request. Do you want us to come and speak at your church? Uh, do you want us to come and speak at your school? Do you have a special event you want to set up? And we'd be happy to assist you and to help organize that. Thank you. Appreciate that. I appreciate your openness no, to share, you. share with us. Yeah, Absolutely. Um, well, thank you for your time, Michael. Thanks for taking, as a, once again, thank, taking the time to be with us. I know all the the people on the call have really appreciated it and you know thank you for sharing in this very important area and and area of of um relevance to our world and our church today i know that there's kind of different philosophies on this on this approach i mean you kind of present the approach that you know god presents an ideal in the bible and as you know we need to steer people you know by his love towards that Amen. I guess there's another approach that's just kind of like let everyone do what they want. Um, there's another one that's just kind of like run them out of the church so we can keep the church pure. 
And, but then there's also people increasingly in Christendom today that think you can blend the two approaches, the, the two lifestyles together. And I think that's something we have to be wary of that, you know, we... So Adam, I have a perfect response to that. What is it? A, a liberal church says, you know, uh, a liberal church says everybody is welcome and, um, and you can stay just the way you are. And then, and then a, um, a conservative church says, uh, you are not welcome here unless you change and, and conform to the principle. And then uh, the true church says, you are welcome here as you are, and Jesus will change the way you live or whatever. It, it's a beautiful explanation of that. And so, you know, as I was hearing you describe kind of the different attitudes or whatever, that really is it. It's amazing when we create a, a, an environment where people can heal. And, and again, God didn't tell us to convert other people. That's the Holy Spirit's job. But I believe that what he did do is he asked us to present the truth in such a loving way that we create a safety net for people to come in, to feel welcome, to feel loved, where they can actually embrace the principles of Jesus Christ and allow the Holy Spirit to make those changes in their life. And you know what? There were people that didn't even know what they were doing, but they did that for me because they were surrendered to the Holy Spirit. And even though they may not have known what I struggled with, or maybe they didn't even know how to help me, they, they knew how to love me and the Holy Spirit made incredible changes in my life. It took time. And what I find amazing is that those people were patient enough, patient enough and loving enough to allow the Lord to take me on that very difficult journey and to love me along the process. And that, if it worked for me, and if God was willing to do it for me, then I can't imagine that he would not do that for somebody else. I think it's the simplest way to explain the gospel. Appreciate that. Thank you. Well, sure. uh, thank you. Thank you guys for being here. Let's, we'll close with a word of prayer. And uh, yeah, we'll close with a word of prayer. Let's bow our heads, guys. Um, Father in heaven, we thank you for this opportunity we've had to gather together to, to learn and to share together. Thank you for Michael. Thank you for blessing his ministry. Thank you for the time he's been able to spend with us here this evening. I pray, Lord, you would be with us as youth and young adult leaders in the local church, that we may have the wisdom and the grace and your Holy Spirit to tackle this important yet sensitive and uh, issue in our church and in the world today. Uh, I pray, Lord, and thank you for the resources that are out there that uh, Michael has made us aware of and other things. And may we be able to use these in a way that would help those in our churches of people of all ages, the, the, those that are directly influenced by this issue and others that uh, can be an influence on others as well. We pray that you would uh, bless each one of us. We pray you would bless coming our ministries, that you would be with them and strengthen them against some of the, the trouble or attacks that they face and give them the grace to continue um, sharing your message um, and love um, with power in this world today. We thank you and we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.